Good afternoon. The next item of business today is a debate on motion 8968 in the name of Bob Doris on building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. I would encourage all members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Bob Doris to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. Presiding officer, this year we all watched with horror as fire engulfed Grenfell Tower. Both then and now, our thoughts and sympathies are with those affected by that tragic event. At that time, the Local Government and Communities Committee was conducting an inquiry into building regulations more widely. As a committee, we felt we must broaden our work to specifically include fire safety and to assure that any lessons from that terrible fire could be considered as part of our work. Last week in the Chamber, we heard from the Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, MSP, about the progress made by the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety. We heard confirmation that local authorities reported that no public or private high-rise blocks was completely clad in ACM except in two high-rise buildings in Glasgow. In those cases, work is ongoing to ensure that fire safety measures are upgraded and a long-term solution is found. I want to focus my comments on two of the committee's recommendations in relation to fire safety before moving on to discuss the broader building regulations aspects of our inquiry. The committee welcomes the quick and collegiate response to establish the ministerial working group. We do not propose to duplicate its work in any way, but to provide constructive scrutiny of the minister and the rest of the group and to uh, scrutinise the progress of its work. We welcome the additional fire safety visits undertaken by Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to reassure and inform tenants about fire safety in their home. We also welcome the ministerial working group commissioning the, co the compilation of a comprehensive inventory of domestic high-rise buildings, which has been completed by spring 2018. This inventory should provide a comprehensive picture of high-rise buildings across Scotland and will inform the, wor the working group's deliberations. However, our committee recommends that that inventory is regularly updated in future. We consider it can provide a valuable resource to, quickly re to respond quickly to any new or emerging building and safety requirements for high-rise buildings. As a living document, perhaps with additional key information present, this inventory can provide a lasting legacy with regards fire safety. Such a system will be far preferable to the situation of a few months ago when local authorities were involved in a time-consuming trawl through paper copies of old building warrants. I believe history will show such processes to be time-consuming, antiquated, and not in the best interests of fire safety. Our committee also examined existing fire safety inspection <coughs> regimes. We heard how housing associations commissioned regular fire safety assessments whilst following occupation, high-rise buildings are subject to quarterly inspections by the fire service. Indeed, we welcome the, the close working relationship between social landlords and the fire service. The committee is sympathetic to a national standard fire assessment process, something I note the Scottish Government is considering. However, we are also sympathetic to this process operating within a system of unannounced fire safety inspections and potentially in conjunction with the FBU's idea of one-off intrusive inspections. Without any slight on current systems, such an approach can further drive up quality and consistency of a Scotland-wide fire safety regime. I look forward to the Minister's response to these suggestions. Presiding officer, the committee will continue to monitor the progress of the Ministerial Working Group and we look forward to taking evidence from the Minister again next year. As I noted at the start of this debate, our work on wider aspects of building regulations was well underway when the Grenfell tragedy happened. In fact, our work on building regulations began in February this year. It began with our post bags and surgeries when we heard about the distress and helplessness, helplessness that some homeowners felt when their new homes did not turn out to be built as well as they thought they should have. For most of us, our home is the largest purchase we will ever make. And as a committee, we wanted to know why for some people their new home was not built as well as they wanted. Over the course of the past 10 months, our inquiry was also widened to include the lessons from the Cole Report on the independent inquiry into the construction of Edinburgh schools. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Education and Skills Committee and its inquiry into school infrastructure. In our report, we have set out our views so far and we have highlighted some key questions for MSPs to comment on the chamber, in the Chamber this afternoon. 
I am sure MSPs will also want to bring their own experiences to the debate, and I and my committee colleagues look forward to hearing what you think. We started an inquiry looking at the verification process that buildings undergo when they are built or extended. In Scotland, anyone who wants to erect a new building, alter or extend an existing building requires permission from a verifier. That is the Building Standards Department of the local authority where the work is to be done. Those officers can inspect the work in progress and after completion. They issue a compliance certificate if that, if that construction has been carried out to their satisfaction and in accordance with the building warrants. That is, of course, as far as they can be ascertained from a visual inspection. In contrast to England and Wales, where verifiers are undertaken by external organisations, including NHBC, in Scotland, the Minister for Local Government and Housing appoints local authorities as verifiers for their own geographical areas. During the course of our inquiry, we heard many reasons for and against these two different approaches and the benefits that each could provide. Those who supported opening up verification to competition argued that it would drive up service levels and delays would be reduced. Some suggested it would provide greater flexibility and the ability to respond to increasing demands. Others, however, argued that the overall level of verification service by local authorities was good, delivering a service that was impartial and which avoided any potential conflict of interest that might arise with private sector verifiers. We heard that the current Scottish approach provides a service accountable to elected members. As a committee, we recognise that those who provide verification service are the public or the private sector do so to a high and professional standard. We also note that although verification services are delivered by councils in Scotland, some councils will use private verifiers when demand increases. In considering the evidence put to us, we are persuaded, on balance, that the benefits of impartiality, accountability and local knowledge that council verification provides outweighs any possible benefits that extending it to other organisations might bring. That said, we recognise that performance in some councils needs to improve. In March 2017, the Minister appointed 17 local authorities as verifiers for six years as they demonstrated a strong performance. Whilst a further 12 councils which had a good performance but had some weaknesses were appointed for a further three years. Overall, presiding officer, that means that 29 of the 32 local authorities had a good or strong performance. The three councils with a poor performance, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Stirling, have been appointed for just one year, have been asked to address aspects of that poor performance. We heard that delays in processing building warrant applications and uncertainties and outcomes were key performance issues which impacted on developers and the overall attractiveness of Scotland for investment. Reasons cited for delays included increased workloads, budget cuts and the loss of staff. Others, however, highlighted the steps taken to improve service and performance management as bringing better customer focus to the local authority building standards system. The Scottish Government asked Pi Tate Consulting to examine the performance of local authorities in their role as building standards verifiers. That report, published in March 2016, drew a number of conclusions, including that, and I quote, stakeholders are generally of the view that verifiers are doing a good job under difficult circumstances and recognise the resourcing difficulties that local authorities face. While, however, while some believe that speed and quality of service has improved since the introduction of the performance framework, concerns remain about the quality of service still varies between local authorities, meaning there is work to do in pursuit of national consistency. Our committee agrees that greater consistency of service and performance across the system is required and crucial to this is a highly motivated, skilled and well-resourced workforce. I invite the Minister to set out how, excuse me, how the government are supporting the provisions of better workforce planning to address these concerns. Another area I want to comment on is the issue of accountability. During the course of our work, there were considerable discussion about whether there should be a statutory scheme to redress, redress faults in buildings after construction and who should be liable for these problems. We heard that the issues of subcontracting can lead to a blurring of the accountability lines when faults or issues arise. Others highlighted that it was the responsibility of house buyers to ensure that they were paying for was actually delivered. 
In considering the evidence before us, we recognise that accountability for the building process is the responsibility of every stakeholder in the construction process, from the builder to the council to the property buyer. Each has a role to play in ensuring they meet the standards to ensure the outcome is safe, secure and a good quality building. We recognise the principle and the recommendations regarding accountability. We have recommended at the start of the building process, consideration is given to providing new build house purchasers with important information and support. This could include clarity about what building standards do and how purchasers might reassure themselves about the quality of the build of their home. I would welcome confirmation from the Minister as to whether it will consider this approach as part of its newly devolved consumer protection responsibilities. We also recommended that more standardised missives and contracts are considered for the standard contract line of the builder will build a house to building in accordance with regulations and to a reasonable standard. We also highlighted the potential of an ombudsman to mediate with disputes should they arise. Whilst NHBC and others highlighted to us the beneficial role of the Consumer Code for Home Builders and its independent dispute resolution service, that only applies to those homes builders who are registered homes within the UK's home warranty body, such as the NHBC. Our proposal for an ombudsman would offer mediation to all those in dispute. I would welcome comment from the Minister as to whether this proposal merits further consideration. I am sure my fellow committee members will want to highlight other issues in our report, but I would invite all of you to contribute to the work of our report in this debate here this afternoon. Do you think there should be a statutory system of redress? How can building standards performances be improved? This work began, presiding officer, where we heard from our constituents, and I suspect some of the other members in this parliament will have had similar issues. This is everyone's chance to put on the record what they think the problems, the issues, but the opportunities to improve the system are. We will return to this work in the new year, presiding officer, when our committee will consider our final views and report and to consider all the comments we've heard this afternoon. So I thank all of those who have contributed to our work so far and who will speak this afternoon. And I most motion S5M 8968 in the name of the local government, the Communities Committee, and commend it to you all. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on the Minister, Kevin Stewart, to open for the government. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to members on building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge the hard work of the Local Government and Communities Committee, uh, which led to their report that was published on the 30th of October. I'd also like to thank the Education and Skills Committee for the work that they've undertaken in this area too. Uh, and I welcome um, uh, what the uh, convener of the committee has described as constructive scrutiny. I think that is extremely useful when we are dealing uh, with these matters. Uh, the report itself draws strongly on the recommendations of the core report, uh, mirroring and supporting a number of issues raised within it, uh, as well as linking to the Education and Skills Committee's report on school infrastructure. And importantly, following the tragic events at Grenfell in June, the committee widened, widened its work to include fire safety uh, within building regulations. Uh, and the committee's report raises complex issues uh, that require full consideration. And I will respond in detail to each of the recommendations and findings uh, before the end of the year. In doing so, I will detail the progress made by the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety, as well as the most up-to-date communications and information that has been shared on issues arising from the Grenfell Public Inquiry and the UK Review of Building Standards. And before I go further, I'd like to say that the fire at Grenfell Tower uh, was a horrific tragedy, tragedy where 71 lives were lost and my thoughts uh, and sympathies uh, remain with the families and friends of everyone affected. And I commend the work of the emergency services on that day and beyond. The Cabinet Secretary, Angela Constance, last week provided Parliament with an update on the work on the Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety, uh, which was set up immediately following the Grenfell fire. Uh, and members will know from the statement, uh, the Ministerial Working Group has moved swiftly uh, to take action. The group has focused on three main areas, uh, reassuring the public of the steps we have taken to ensure that a tragedy like Grenfell will not happen in Scotland, 
establishing the fire safety of high-rise domestic buildings and moving quickly to improve the fire safety and compliance of building regulations. A key element of the group's focus has been on a range of measures to enhance and strengthen building regulations. Uh, compliance to and enforcement of those reg regulations as well as fire safety within regulations. And we have established two comprehensive expert groups to review building standards. And I'd like to outline what those reviews will do. Uh, the first is a review of fire safety and building standards uh, chaired by Dr. Paul Stollard. The review, which held its first meeting on 27th of October, will ensure the fire safety standards and building regulations are robust and clear, with a focus on high-rise domestic buildings and high-rise non-domestic buildings with sleeping accommodation. The full remit, remit of this review is available on the Scottish Government website, and the expert panel will also adopt a flexible approach in order to be ready to respond to any relevant er evidence that may become available from the Grenfell Public Inquiry. The second group is reviewing building standards compliance and enforcement and is chaired by Professor John Cole, uh, the author of the independent inquiry into the construction of Edinburgh schools. It will examine the roles and responsibilities of everyone involved in all elements of construction from start to finish. And the review will consider the actions needed before a building warrant is granted and a completion certificate is accepted, as well as the role of certification in the construction journey. Chairs of such high caliber leading these reviews alongside a wealth of experts in their fields demonstrates that we are determined to ensure that our regulations in Scotland are amongst the most robust in the world. Presiding officer, the Local Government and Communities Committee report covers a number of other issues which I'd now like to address. Uh, local authorities are appointed by Scottish ministers as verifiers to carry out the independent checks of building design and construction through granting building warrants and accepting completion certificates. And considering the last appointments earlier this year, I had concerns over the performance of some local authorities, and the convener has highlighted that in his speech, particularly on processing delays and customer engagement. I took account of this when appointments were made on the basis that performance must improve. I also introduced a new Scotland-wide operating framework, an updated performance framework under the appointment process to measure that performance. I appreciate the pressures that building standard services are under, and in July, I increased the building warrant-related fees, which had remained the same since 2005. This will give all local authorities a boost in income, but I would stress that good performance is not always linked to high levels of income. The building standard system is preemptive, with permission needed before work can start and new buildings occupied. As such, Excessive processing times can delay projects starting or continuing through different stages. The role of inspection throughout the construction is key to getting completed buildings that are compliant with building regulations. This is primarily inspection by the building owner or developer as the person responsible for the work. This includes using certifiers, clerks of works, and others to give them the reassurance that they have met their responsibilities before ultimately signing off the project, project as compliant. This also includes inspection as part of any new build warranty or insurance. For the local authority, before a completion certificate can be accepted, this is the necessary independent verification checks needed. And these checks must be risk-based, consistent, and designed to protect the public interest. I'll give way. Yeah. Daniel Johnson. On that very point, these are the key points that actually the Cole report found were deficient. So that, that both in terms of certificates being given where key structural uh, uh, components were missing, such as wall ties, and where certificates were given, but also buildings open, and sometimes for a period of up to two years or more, without building certificates being in place at all. I was just wondering what the Minister's reflections were on those two key observations from the Cole report. Minister. Uh, Mr Johnson was there when I appeared in front of the Education and Skills Committee and uh, I repeat what I, I said there, that these are issues that we need to look at very closely indeed. Um, and I will come uh, back uh, in a little while to roles and responsibilities, which I think are really important um, in this regard. Um, as the formal enforcement body, 
The local authority also has a separate legislative role. And it is important that when enforcement action is necessary, this is done in a proactive manner to address non-compliances and work down, done without permission. Our review group will consider building standards processes, inspection regimes and the roles and responsibilities of the building owner and the local authority as verifier and enforcer. A strong compliance-driven building standards system requires all players to understand their role and their responsibilities and to meet them. And this means the building owner, industry and local authorities have to have the right people with the necessary skills to play their part. And I'm aware of the challenges faced by industry to attract and retain the right people with the appropriate competencies to face the challenges ahead. And that is why we are currently engaging with Construction Scotland and recently held an industry summit to explore how we can work together and ensure that these challenges are met. Finally, President Officer, I cannot emphasise enough the importance of the lessons already learnt following the Grenfell fire, and I'm sure that this will continue. The ministerial group and the reviews we have set up will be ready to respond to any further findings that emerge from the inquiries and reviews going on across the UK. Scottish ministers are not complacent on the importance of building regulations and compliance and enforcement. The preemptive nature is one of its strengths, but it must work in partnership with industry to deliver safe and compliant buildings. And I hope that my brief overview of the current work of the ministerial working group and the setting up of the fire compliance and enforcement re review groups reassures Parliament that the Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that buildings are safe. This means learning from recent events, responding to any evidence that emerges and taking the appropriate actions as necessary. And I welcome the scrutiny that there has been from this parliament and I look forward to hearing uh, the debate this afternoon. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Graeme Simpson to be followed by David Stewart. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, buying a new home is the biggest financial commitment that most of us will ever make. Whether it's second hand or brand new, you want the process to be seamless and you don't want to find faults later on that you are not aware of. Before I became an MSP, while serving as a councillor, I became aware through a number of cases that people's rights when buying new homes are not what they should be and that the system of checking buildings standard and quality was and is patchwork and sometimes frankly shoddy. I was called in to assist with people living on an estate where maybe up to half the properties had had problems with their foundations. Some had managed to get help from the builders if they claimed before the initial short guarantee ran out. Others were at the mercy of the warranty providers who then took over and many were not happy with the service they got. When I got involved, the legal position was that the original builders, a major national firm, did not have to do anything and the warranty providers basically an insurance company made their own call on whether to pay out on claims i managed to get the builders around the table and do the right thing they agreed to fix the problems and offered a bespoke further guarantee on repaired foundations the first time it had been done in the uk only one house on the estate has work outstanding but this came about despite the law despite the system. I had a similar situation with blocks of flats where the roofs had failed and again managed to get the builders to act when they didn't have to. These experiences showed me two things. One, people buying new homes should have greater redress when things go wrong. And two, houses should never be built with such major faults. The checking system should be more thorough. When I became an MSP and a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, I suggested this was an area we could explore. It's fair to say that fellow committee members were skeptical, but will run round to the importance of the issue as soon as we started to take evidence. And the evidence we heard from members of the public who'd suffered under the system was particularly powerful. As we conducted our inquiry, the report into the Edinburgh schools fiasco was published. And this raised the same issues around building regulations and lack of scrutiny. Then Grenfell happened and our inquiry expanded into fire safety. So what are the two issues I mentioned earlier? First, the rights of new home buyers. 
Consumer goods legislation gives consumers a range of remedies, refund, repair and replacement if goods are faulty. New home buyers do not automatically have these rights. Any guarantees are not underwritten by law and are a voluntary act by developers offered to house, house buyers. And that's the way that the developers like it. There's a voluntary code of practice. The key word is voluntary. Consumer law is reserved. So that's not something we looked at as a committee. So I'll be raising the matter directly with Sajid Javid to explore UK-wide solutions. There are, though, things we could do in Scotland. I asked the Law Society if standardised missives would help, and they agreed it would. We'd need a change in the law, though, to bring that about. Developers may resist, but it would remove much of the uncertainty that presently arises from the bespoke nature of each builder's sales contract, which deters many from pursuing claims. The contract could set out how defects are handled, uh, and money could be withheld for potential repairs. And there could be provision for dealing with disputes before referral to an ombudsman. And access to an ombudsman, which I think would have to be a new role, would be another layer of protection. Secondly, what about the system that allows buildings with major faults to be constructed, be they public or private? Currently, building control officers risk assess sites to decide how often to inspect them. They don't inspect every stage of every house, hiding behind a woolly phrase, reasonable inquiry. Now, if you bought a new home, you might think it reasonable to assume it had been rigorously checked before a completion certificate has been issued. Not so. Reasonable inquiries can mean very little. A house buyer can have no confidence that their home has been checked for build quality at every stage because it probably hasn't. There's currently no way of guarantee, guaranteeing that buildings are fit for purpose. A completion certificate is not a guarantee that the building has been constructed properly, merely that it has been constructed. They're not worth the paper they're written on. It's absolutely essential that those issuing completion certificates carry out mandatory checks at key stages of building. This was also highlighted by the Cole report. So who should verify that work that has been done properly? We took mixed evidence on this, but in the end, we were not convinced that work should go to the private sector. On balance, we felt that councils should continue to do the work as they are impartial. However, Kevin Stewart renewed licenses for all councils, uh, but only gave poorly performing Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Stirling councils one year. It's my view that if they've not upped their game by the end of that, then private firms should be considered. The committee heard strong evidence that Clarks of Works would help drive up quality. And Kevin Stewart told the committee, quotes, in my opinion, having an experienced Clark of Works might involve spending, but will save a lot in the future. And I agree with that. Presiding officer, uh, we should, I'm almost finished. Somebody wants to give? Okay, if I get... Convener Bob Doris. Uh, thank Mr Simpson for giving away. It was in relation to the idea of the private sector coming into Glasgow, Edinburgh, Stirling after a year. That, of course, deviates from our committee recommendation uh, that, that, we're, that we're looking at today. I'm just wondering if you give consideration for other local authorities who could come into those three local authorities to drive up standards. It doesn't have to be a private sector solution. It could be another local authority within the public sector could perform that role also. Graeme Simpson. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, I'm merely, uh, I'm giving my view, um, and my view is that private firms should be considered, uh, but I would also say other councils should be considered. Um, so, presiding officer, we should aim for a system where buildings are built to an acceptable standard, that someone is responsible for ensuring that happens, and that buyers, be they individuals or whoever, have recourse if things go wrong. The proposals to have standardised missives, an ombudsman, mandatory inspections at key stages and clerks of works would go a long way to redress the balance, as would better consumer protection. And I commend these proposals to the Parliament. Thank you very much. I now call on David Stewart to be followed by Sandra White.
Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I want to start by thanking the Local Government and Communities Committee for their excellent report on building regulations and fire safety. Obviously, ensuring the safety of new buildings in Scotland requires strong and wide-ranging builder regulations that are enforced without compromise. And on that point, President Officer, I welcome the Committee's recommendation that the power of verification should not be extended beyond local authorities. I believe to gift this power out to the private sector would open the door for potential conflicts of interest and, account and uh, unaccountability, as well as a loss of valuable local knowledge. Nevertheless, it's key that the verification process does not only support new building projects on paper, but also in practice. It's clear that delays in processing applications have had a significant impact on developers and also can undermine confidence in Scotland as an attractive investment prospect. Sadly, these delays are a result of the, the old time story where we've been too familiar. Cuts to local authorities have left staff burdened with increasingly heavier workloads, having to spend more time on admin and less time visiting sites. And as an example, almost half uh, of the respondents in Uniston's building stress report stated they faced budget cuts the last year, and another that 20% stated that cuts have been severe. In reality, the eventual losers are building residents and the general public. Of particular concern were reports that because of delays, build builders are going ahead without the proper consents, raising question of how compliance can ever be eventually verified. If the delays are to be improved and safety guaranteed, the only real solution is for local authorities to be adequately resourced. All other options are merely unsustainable sticking plasters. Um, Mr. Stewart has just said, presiding officer, that buildings are going ahead without consents. Uh, what I would ask of any member in this place is if they have any evidence of that whatsoever, I would want to know about it, please. David Stewart. Uh, following the terrible events of the Grenfell Tower disaster, I commend the committee for also taking the initiative to extend their inquiry to encompass the safety aspects of building regulations. Fire safety has been a significant issue in Scotland, even pre-Grenfell, and so it's this topic, President Officer, I now wish to focus. Over the past decades, the number of domestic fires has been decreasing right across the United Kingdom. However, Scotland has consistently had the highest rate of fire outbreaks compared to other UK nations. In Scottish homes, for example, between 2015 and 16, there were almost 46% more fires per million people than in England and Wales. Indeed, in that time period, you were more likely to die in a dwelling house fire in Scotland than anywhere else in the UK. Now, that's not to take away from the invaluable work of the Fire and Rescue Service, who operate under incredibly difficult circumstances. Their efforts in assessing Scottish buildings and reassuring residents following the Grenfell fire are especially to be praised. However, budget cuts to the service are again a worrying trend. So it's crucial when addressing issues of fire safety, we stay relevant to the situation in Scotland. The review of local government committee and the ministerial working group have focused particularly on fire safety in high-rise buildings. While if completely understandable in light of the circumstances of the Grenfell Tower, I would encourage them to go further. In fact, if you look at the actual evidence, in 2016-17, only 4% of domestic fires were in flats of 10 storeys or more. On the other hand, across the breadth of Scottish society, the effects of fire are not equally felt. In reality, the risk of fire is much higher in areas of social economic deprivation. This is evident even in my home city of Inverness. Regrettably, Scotland's higher rate of fire death and injury is disproportionately carried by our most vulnerable po populations. With this in mind, I wish to turn to a solution I believe has the potential to impact long-lasting change. Fire suppression systems, often referred to as sprinkler systems, are a proven method of preventing the spread of fire and saving lives. For example, despite Scotland's high frequency of fire, there has never been multiple fire deaths where a working sprinkler system has been installed. That's why, as members will know, I'm bringing forward a member's bill requiring the installation of fire suppression systems into all new social housing. Many fears around the use of sprinklers are unfounded urban myths. Contrary to what might be seen on TV, whole properties are not drenched in streams of water at the appearance of a single spark. Rather, heat-sensitive sprinkler heads operate individually to contain a fire. This sophisticated technology actually limits the damage caused by both the initial fire and the measures taken to fully extinguish it. And not only are they effective, studies suggest sprinkler systems are reliable. 
The most recent research from England concluded that sprinklers operate as expected in 94% of all cases. For this reason, a 2015 cost-benefit analysis commissioned by the Scottish Government accepted that, and I quote, the evidence indicates that most of these deaths and injuries and much of the damage would have been prevented had the properties concerned been fitted with sprinklers. Now, of course, presiding officer, there's been improvements to Scotland's existing approach to sprinklers, such as in sheltered housing. But as members will know, in 2016, following a successful members' bill, uh, the Welsh Assembly provides that all new homes in Wales are fitted with sprinkler systems. Yet, despite their life-saving potential, Scottish building re regulations require only fire suppression systems in high-rise buildings built since 2005. The result is a postcode lottery, with older high-rises and other domestic dwellings not covered. Across Scotland, some local authorities have embraced the use of sprinklers beyond the existing requirements. So trailblazing councils like Angus, Fife and Dundee have all adopted policies of fitting sprinklers into new social housing. Their development stands as a shining example of the housing that I want to see uh, across Scotland. So in conclusion, I would thank again the excellent work by the uh, committee and all the work that the clerks have carried out. At UK level, I would just flag up that the UK Labour Party is calling for all social housing tower blocks to be retrofitted uh, with sprinklers. And I would encourage the local government committee to scrutinise the deliberations of the ministerial working group uh, on this particular subject. And I believe, in conclusion, that is crucially important uh, that we support the use of sprinklers within social housing. Lowering our high fire statistics in the future will require action now. Our response to Grenfell should not be a mere near-jet reaction, but carefully considered and able to impact real change. And I think the time is now for investing in sprinkler technology and investing in the safety of all Scottish social housing well into the future. All that we need, as Walter Scott said, is the will to do and the soul to dare. Thank you very much. And I call on Sandra White to fo be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I thank the committee for its report? It's an excellent report. And I think the speeches we've heard today have been excellent as well. I'm not a member of the committee, but obviously, as has been mentioned before, uh, every MSP has this situation, and particularly in, in my area and others as well, uh, building control and working along with self-certification, inspections, verifiers. is something that comes up constantly, all, all, of, all of the time. And I, tan I can't disagree with anything that I've heard here today. Now, there's two specific areas that I want to touch on, uh, obviously on the building control and the report, which is here, but also on the situation, the tragedy in Grenfell, which obviously, thankfully, hasn't resulted in a tragedy in my constituency, but there are two buildings in my constituency which are, is affected by the cladding. And I just want to get some clarification and obviously my thoughts down as well in the report of what we can actually do to not even protect um, people who buy a house, but to bring them justice. Because as has been said to you before, it's the largest purchase you'll ever make. And yet the, it's a minefield for anyone trying to get any repairs done or any justice at all. And um, the honourable gentleman over there had mentioned the fact that uh, about the supply of goods to consumers. And you're absolutely right. The Sale and Supply to Consumers Regulation 2002. If they're faulty when you purchase them, they have a legal right uh, to compensation, a full or partial refund, a free repair or replacement. And certainly, I don't know if I'll be writing to Javid, but I'll certainly write to whoever I can to see if we can get that devolved to Scotland. I think it's really, really important. And I wanted to pick up on something that uh, obviously um, Bob Doris had mentioned and others as well about the report. <clears throat> and that's in regarding the councils which don't actually come up to scratch. And uh, I believe it's page seven, uh, paragraph 30 and 32. But I'll just read out 32. Uh, and it mentions that we acknowledge the Minister's finding that a few local authorities will need to improve their performance by April 2018 in order for their appointment as verifiers to be extended. And on that, I do think local councils are the best people to verify because we've obviously had uh, some horror stories uh, out with local authorities verifying uh, and self-certification uh, in buildings and therefore seek an update by April 2018. There will be a report hopefully put forward. It also mentions to go into the work relating to building standards have been rated as 
poor performance. But obviously, Glasgow City Council is one of them, and Glasgow City Council is uh, in, within my area, my, my constituency. So I look forward to that report to see exactly uh, what can happen. And I mentioned the fact that my constituents at the moment uh, and, and these two towers, as they call them, two blocks that's there on the, the harbour site, uh, really are having a horrendous time. And the, the horrendous time they're having is, we talked about fire safety, uh, these people are paying £2,000 a day, a day, £2,000 a day for three gentlemen to walk around with a, a torch, etc., looking for a fire, <clears throat> £2,000 a day and they may actually be penalised, the, the residents there, and they're not all by means rich people. These, these uh, flats aren't half a million pound flats. Uh, they may actually be uh, cited to have to pay for the, the cladding to be removed and replaced at a cost of between one and 10 million pounds. Now, who's responsible for that? That's what we're trying to find out. That's why I've met with the residents, obviously, and they've been advised to get a lawyer on board. And that's why I come to the verifier. And I know it's been mentioned before, trying to get my head around all this verifier, self-certification. It's all speaking. It's not really in the layman's terms, but uh, I'll do my best. Now, the Local Authority of Building Standards, that's LBASS, <clears throat> have stated that the work of verifiers has two elements to check that the building plans comply with building regulations when an application is made for a building warrant and undertaking reasonable inquiry to verify that the building work complies with the approved uh, details and regulations. It also says the verifier can inspect ongoing work and may also require work to be opened up to show that compliance with the regulations has been achieved. Now, on that point, and I think it's a really important point about compliance with regulations has been achieved. I'd like to read out just a paragraph. I wouldn't name uh, the constituent who's sent this in. I've had lots and lots of letters. But this is their story about what's happened to them and happening just now. I bought the flat, the flat that I've named about the £2,000 a day, maybe the £10 million to fix it. I bought the flat on the 24th of June 2005 directly from the builder, and I think I can name the builder because we know who they are, Taylor Wimpy, almost two months after the change, after the change in building regulations, which had been on the statute books since 2003 and became mandatory on May 2005. Now, what I would like somebody to tell me or have a look at this is who is responsible for this. The regulations came out in 2003 before the buildings were completed. Now, I don't think it takes Einstein to assume that anyone who's building and it's not being built, they must have known, or they would, they, I would assume they would know about the change in building regulations, i.e. the cladding, which came in force in Scotland, because our regulations are different from, from the, the rest of the UK. So what you need to ask is who is responsible. Now, if they knew, if they, this came out in 2003, it came out in May 2005, you buy the flat in June 2005 with this cladding, which now is deemed to be, uh, you know, you have to remove it. It's dangerous. Who's responsible for that? And I take you back to the paragraph I read before about the verifier can inspect ongoing work and may also require work to be opened up to show that compliance with the regulations has been achieved. Is that the builder that's responsible for you? Is it the verifier, i.e. the council that knows about this? These things have to be highlighted and people need to know exactly what they can do. As I said before, these folk aren't millionaires. It could be any one of us and yet they're stuck in this trap. £2,000 a day and nearly £10 million to repair this, to take this cladding off. And that's why I think the report is absolutely a fantastic report and I'm so pleased to be able to speak in this debate just to highlight this fact that self-certification, building warrants, it really needs looked at, and I really would support a clerk of works being brought back in to ensure that people know exactly what they're buying. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Mark Griffin. Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I refer members to my register of interests as I am a councillor on Scottish Borders Council. I would firstly like to thank the Local Government and Communities Committee for its work. In particular, I think the committee and its clerks deserve praise for their flexibility and willingness to extend its inquiry to cover issues arising from the Scottish Government's review following the horrific disaster at Grenfell Tower. 
Whilst we await the outcome of the inquiry into Grenfell, one thing is clear. The fire penetrated every element of the building and compromised the, fire, the, the escape routes. And it is those images of acrid black smoke swanking the tower, of flames ripping without mercy through its halls, and the resulting terrible loss of life that underpins why this debate is so important. This should not be considered as a reserved issue or a devolved issue. It is an issue that resonates profoundly with all of us as parliamentarians, as parents and as human beings. Ensuring that there is an effective review and delivery of a robust regulatory framework for building standards and fire safety is the contribution that we in this parliament can make to minimise the risk that a tragedy like Grenfell will ever happen in Scotland. The Scottish Conservatives welcome the establishment of the Ministerial Working Group and we look forward to reviewing its findings alongside those of the Scottish Government's consultation. In doing so, I hope we will also look at the work that is currently being undertaken by the UK Government, who have been taking written evidence from key experts in fire safety since that awful day in London. In order... Yes, mm -hmm. Kevin Stewart. President Officer, uh, I can assure the Chamber that uh, I've been taking part in the UK Ministerial Working Group too. Um, and in terms of the sharing of information, uh, my officials and myself have also talked to Dame Judith Hackett, who is heading up the UK Review of Building Standards. Uh, that will continue. Um, I think that we all uh, can learn from one another. Beyond that, I'm meeting the UK Minister of Housing, Alex Sharma, on Monday, and without doubt, this will be on the agenda. Michelle Ballantyne. I'm really, really delighted to hear that, Minister, and I think that that's an excellent example of, of cooperation in an area and at a time when it really needs to be. Um, I want to use the time I, ha I have today to flag a number of important issues around fire safety that have arisen for me on studying the committee's report and from my own research and experience. First of all, though, I want to acknowledge that the work, the work, sorry, first of all, I want to acknowledge that the working group has already commissioned and is making substantial progress with an infantry and inspection of high-rise domestic buildings in Scotland, and that is something to be welcomed. I noted also that it is the committee's view that the objectives of the working group should be to focus on a review of current building and fire safety regulations and to make necessary changes. I hope that in doing so, the working group will consider recommending that all regulations and technical guidance are subject to constant review and incremental improvement to respond and keep abreast of innovative construction methods, systems and products. This should also be underpinned by a robust requirement for and the provision of ongoing training for those charged with building and fire safety regulation compliance, particularly around the area of fire safety where current regulations offer little explanation of the rationale. Inevitably, in the, in the wake of Grenfell, there have been calls for all high-rise domestic properties to be fitted with fire sprinklers, and I understand the Ministerial Working Group will examine this issue. While support for sprinklers is unanimous in this chamber, and understandably so, I would urge a note of caution. Without a rigorous maintenance programme in place, sprinkler systems can run the risk of not functioning optimally, Further, sprinklers must also not be seen as a risk reduction that reduces the level of fire brigade cover required. The Ministerial Working Group must recognise that maintenance of sprinkler systems is imperative, and I hope to see some real and detailed analysis of this in its report. Mm -hmm. Daniel Johnson. I quite agree that sprinklers can't be a substitute for other things, but is she, is she not really making a case to make sure that, that our regulations are robust in all regards and that they're all followed through and inspected properly, not simply just sprinklers? Michelle Ballantyne. Yes, I, I would agree with that, but in this particular point, I'm talking specifically about sprinklers. But you're absolutely right. Everything should be robust in terms of its follow-through. Uh, presiding officer, we cannot and should not understate the role of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in supporting a robust approach to fire safety. And I welcome the Minister's commitment to consider an increased role for them in, ver in the verification process. I trust, however, that any added role in this capacity will be properly resourced given the strains that Scottish and fire rescue are currently experiencing. Presiding officer, the last point I want to raise is a very important area in the consideration in fire safety design and advice going forward. Currently, the term fire engineer is not connected to any particular professional qualification, and accordingly, the experience, training, and quality of advice under that title can vary. 
There have been calls for the, fire, from, for the fire engineering industry to develop a system for establishing competence on an ongoing basis. And I hope that the government will look at this key area to ensure the fire safety design of buildings in Scotland and indeed the, across the UK are underpinned. The process to verifying building design before issuing a building warrant in Scotland should be a holistic joined up approach fortified by professional expertise struggling, expertise and robust chartership. That means, of course, it should involve the SFRS and it should involve local authorities, but working in conjunction with industry specialists with expertise in fire dynamics, including ta ta toxicology, ignition, chemical interaction and the structural design and fire protection of buildings. In closing, presiding officer, the establishment of a ministerial working group is a laudable step forward. I welcome the consideration of the role of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service in assessing fire safety in high-rise domestic buildings. And I look forward to reviewing the outcome of this body of work. And I certainly hope that it can be a catalyst for delivering a fire and safety and building regulation framework fit for the 21st century. Thank you. I call Mark Griffin to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer, and I uh, congratulate the Local Government and Communities Committee for the work they've done so far in bringing this issue to the Chamber. And in a matter of weeks, the, the Parliament and MSPs here will consider whether it will pass on £300 million of cuts to our services handed down by the Conservative Government. And if previous years are anything to go by, it's vital local services and hard-working local government staff which will bear the brunt of any so-called savings and presiding officer i know that this isn't a budget debate but the decisions that we make in the chamber about how we fund services are, are fundamental to the debate on building standards and safety in scotland now welcome this report and, and the committee's detailed work and i, I fully agree verification must remain a locally delivered government function. And, but as been mentioned before, the, the backdrop to the committee's inquiry has both been a tragic and eye-opening. A, a number of speakers have reminded us how the Grenfell disaster rapidly moved our attention to the importance of building regulation, which the committee rightly widened the scope of its inquiry to include. Of course, the, the impetus for the inquiry was the the failure of the PFI agreements, which led to scores of schools in this city uh, being closed. But at the heart of the report is, is a debate about how we should provide um, a public service in response to the state being eroded. And for us on this side, the response is that we should fight the cuts that have brought us to this point. Our plan is to use the taxpayers that we have uh, recognising that the salami slicing within local government now totaling £1.5 billion since 2011 is harming the frontline services we all use and um, rely on. But it's also had a, a drastic impact on the back office functions where um, staff numbers and services have been, have been slashed, like building standards. Yep, certainly. Kevin Stewart. I, I thank uh, Mr Griffin for giving way, presiding officer, uh, and we could have a, an argument across the chamber uh, about resourcing, and uh, I, I would say that last year we uh, delivered an extra £400 million to local services at local government. But in terms of building standards, I've given all local th authorities the opportunity uh, to beef up their building standards service by uh, raising the fees, which were not raised since 2005. Would Mr Griffin join me in urging local authorities to ensure that that money is used uh, to beef up their building standard services? Mark Griffin. I, I welcome that. And there are other, other ideas um, which are flying around, around um, a similar idea that was proposed around um, added fees for the planning service to, to provide for for an improved service and, and a similar um, option on, on building standards. But um, we do have colleagues in local government. We have trade unions represent local government staff who are coming to us and, and telling us about the pressure 
you know, particularly back office staff are facing. And you know, just weeks after Grenfell uh, Unison's building stress report highlighted that half of all building standard staff are feeling the cuts in funding with nine and ten, nine out of ten facing heavier workloads in building standards offices across Scotland. There are fifty six fewer staff than there are in, than there were in two thousand and ten. Building standards officers feeling overstretched, undervalued and exhausted. And, and months after Grenfell, when we belatedly got the news that homes in Glasgow have ACM cladding, that only underlined Unison's findings. And the message in that report is clear. Our local authorities must have the, the funding to carry out effective verification, allowing verification to move away from local authorities, I, I, I think, would, would be a mistake. And I want to emphasise that building standards must be a, a protected local government service, and that's not a, an ideological point, but one made for the sake of, of public safety. The arguments have been well rehearsed over issues down due to impartiality and conflicts of interest that I firmly believe that service should remain with local authorities. There should be no question about who provides the verification service. Instead, we should be asking how a quality public service is prioritising public safety is funded, and, and that includes the contributions that developers make. As I was saying, the call from the house building industry to pay higher fees in return for better planning service was a, a constructive move. And with a, an economy, most would say limping along, I can understand calls for verification to be extended. The National Housing Building Council said that the, the time for obtaining a stage one warrant can vary from two weeks to 45 weeks and from nine weeks to 98 weeks at stage two. I think that, that's, just not un that's just not acceptable. Um, and when builders are, are up against a, a glacial building standard service because of cuts and, and understaffing issues, I can understand why our housing crisis is so persistent and, and continues to stay with us. Our call for a more comprehensive house building plan that goes beyond those start and, and completion, completion numbers is alive to that and to achieve the ambition of 50,000 affordable homes or, or to revert to pre-crash house building levels, we really need to take a, a long hard look at how we support the supply and maintain skills and planning infrastructure. Sign off, sir. We're having, uh, we are debating the, the power of verification today, and that, that might seem like a, a technical issue, but it is a crucial one um, about the impact of austerity on public safety and public services. And with weeks until the budget, we have to think closely about the unintended consequences of decisions we make in this chamber. Thank you. I call on Andy Whiteman to be followed by Liam McCarthy. I thank you, Presiding Officer. And first of all, I'd like to thank my committee colleagues, Clark, Spice, and all those who have given evidence to the committee's inquiry for the avoidance of doubt. I'm responding to the report here on my own behalf and that of the Scottish Green Party. As others have already said, the inquiry began modestly, um, but the tragic fire at Grenfell placed our deliberations in an altogether uh, harsher focus. Building regulations exist to ensure that the buildings we live and work in are safe meet relevant environmental standards and protect the interests of others in relation to, for example, fire, noise uh, and odours. And in general terms, I think it's fair to say we found that our building standard regime uh, is reasonably robust. But as we found out in the course of our deliberations, the system has weaknesses, some of these substantial. They were brought into sharp focus, obviously, by the Cole Report, which the Education Committee has been looking into and no doubt will, will be a major feature of the Grenfell uh, inquiry. But given the importance of standards, it's vital that they be both robust in their terms and rigorously applied in practice. We've heard talk this afternoon about verification, and the National House Building Council and others uh, have said to us that they would like to see the job of verifying that standards are being met uh, to be made available to the private sector. I'm not persuaded that a case has been made why this should happen. I welcome the committee's recognition that verification should not be tendered to the private sector and instead should remain within the control of local authorities for the benefits of impartiality, accountability and uh, local knowledge. 
I have a wider problem uh, with calls for verification to be opened up to the private sector. As many members know, I've long called for the speculative volume house building industry model to be scrapped. It's not fit for purpose. It does very little to address the housing crisis beyond inflating house prices and delivering overly priced homes with short design lives. And the speculative nature means that the needs and interests of consumers are nowhere in the process. And this is at the root of many of the problems that Mr. Uh, Simpson's constituents uh, brought to, uh, to him. And in addition, this is an industry dominated by very few large players with substantial influence uh, in the industry. Indeed, for example, Nicola Barclay, the Chief Executive of Industry Body Homes for Scotland, also sits on the board of the Consumer Code for Home Builders and the Scottish Committee of the NHBC. An oligarchy of large nationwide businesses now dominate lobby and seek to assert control of housing policy based on their own agenda. In the last decade since the recession, we've seen a sharp decline in the number of SME businesses operating in the house building sector. This has proved advantageous for large-scale developers, but it delivers little competition and reliability or assurance for the consumer. And I think this is important, particularly in relation to questions raised in the report about the role of clerks of works and whether their role should be extended within the building industry. The term clerk of works derives from clerics uh, who were responsible for the supervision of the building of churches from the 13th century uh, on. And as the Institute of Clerks of Works and Construction Inspectorate note on in their website, this is an institute incidentally with a very long history, uh, the role of a clerk of works is a very isolated one they describe it as. Clerks must be absolutely impartial and independent and are employed by and accountable to the client for ensuring building quality. For example, a health board that wishes to procure a new hospital will, for example, employ architects and planning consultants to design new buildings. They will then put the construction project out to tender. And the health board will then employ a clerk of works to check that the work of the contractor uh, is done according to the, the plans and that the clerk of works will look after the health board's interests as the client. By definition, clerks cannot be in the pay of the contractor. And this poses particular problems when applied to the speculative volume house building industry, which very unusually in a European context is responsible for the construction of the vast majority of new homes in the UK. The client in the case of the volume house building industry is the house building company. But crucially, they're not going to be the owner of the building for very long. They will sell it after completion. Indeed, often before completion or even before work starts, the ultimate client, the future homeowner, has no one, no one looking after their interests during construction because of the speculative model. And that's one reason why we need to move to a more European model of self-procured housing by individuals, cooperatives, councils and others, which accounts typically for 60 to 70 percent of all new builds in most continental European countries. It's also the reason why a clerk of works is meaningless in this context because the interests of the speculative volume house builder are not the same as the interest of the person who will ultimately acquire that house and live in it. So the best way to ensure high building standards is firstly to invest, as uh, others have pointed out, in the building surveying profession within local authorities. And I welcome the order that uh, we passed, I think, in committee some months ago, allowing councils to increase the charges uh, for building standards. And second, to move to a model of self-procurement of housing by individuals, cooperatives, housing associations and others. Such a model will drive up standards by making sure that the interests of the building owner are represented and protected from the very beginning of the building project. Presiding officer, I look forward to working with the committee to produce a final report in light of the contributions uh, made today. I think it's important to note that the report we've published uh, has a number of recommendations in it, but most of the recommendations are expressed in the form of questions. These questions are designed to be answered uh, by MSPs and indeed others who've been engaged in, in the work of the committee over the length of its inquiry in order to help us produce a final report. Thank you. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Ben McPherson. 
thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. As a non-member of the committee, I'm not sure I'm in the best position to provide the answers Andy uh, Whiteman's just referred to, but I, I would certainly pay tribute to the committee um, for the work it's done, uh, for the recommendations it's made, and, and I think for the le very legitimate um, uh, and pertinent questions that it is uh, included in this interim uh, report. I think these, um, these inquiries are never straightforward, but I don't think it has been uh, helped, and I think the committee is to be very much commended for the way in which it's managed to incorporate um, the, uh, the findings of the, the coal report uh, and also respond to the uh, horrific events uh, of the Grenfell disaster in expanding out uh, its inquiry uh, and uh, the evidence that it has taken. Uh, on that latter point, um, I, I would uh, add solely to, to what I did when Angela Constance made her statement uh, uh, last week uh, on the work of the Ministerial Working Group that I very much support the three work streams uh, uh, that uh, were outlined uh, by the Cabinet Secretary and reiterated by uh, Kevin Stewart. They seem to be sensible uh, and, uh, and very welcome. I, I think, as I said in response to that statement, however, um, while expanding the role and responsibilities of the fire and rescue services um, seems to be a, a reasonable expectation on the back of the, the work ongoing on uh, fire safety. I think, as Mark Griffin said, uh, we're talking about a service which already is under considerable uh, strain, and I think it would be helpful to understand uh, the resourcing of any expansion of those roles uh, and responsibilities. Uh, turning to the issue of, of uh, verification, um, I, I listened with interest to the, uh, the contributions of other, other colleagues and um, understand why uh, committee members were wrestling with um, the, the competing interests of, of, of whether this process and responsibility should remain within uh, local authorities uh, or be uh, outsourced to the, the private sector. And I think, on balance, I, I accept that in terms of accountability, in terms of avoiding conflicts of interest, uh, uh, ensuring impartiality, um, that the, uh, the course recommended by the committee does seem to be a sensible one. But I think accepting that there are real capacity issues in, in a number of local authorities, I think leaving open the option uh, for, for bringing in uh, support where it's necessary from the private sector or, 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 or expertise from the private sector should be an option uh, that remains uh, open. Unison are just uh, one of a number uh, who have pointed to the particular strains uh, in local authorities as a result, uh, as a result of those uh, capacity uh, and workload uh, constraints. It's not simply in, in verification and, and building building warrants and planning permissions as well, we see this uh, arising. And I think the Minister made a, a valid point in relation to any increase in the fees in relation to um, this work, uh, that it does need to be directed towards improvement in the service that's provided. That's what gives it its legitimacy. Uh, I think that's what uh, will ensure the buy-in uh, from those who are subject uh, to those uh, fees. Um, I, in relation to the, the coal report, obviously it's talked about the need to strengthen the verification uh, processes. I think the exploration of mandatory inspections um, is, is a sensible route to go, although we need to be clear what the criteria would be uh, on which these are based. Um, and also we need to make sure that uh, penalties are enforced so that this doesn't, seem to, uh, this doesn't come across as simply a, a superficial uh, exercise. Uh, I think there is a sense that more site inspections uh, are needed, but I think what's also required is a culture shift within the industry uh, itself. Turning to a couple of, of issues that are probably more tangential to, um, to this uh, topic, but, but important nonetheless, and one um, I was very glad to hear Andy Whiteman uh, touching upon uh, in relation to um, what I see as a, a fairly centralised approach now uh, to the procurement of uh, housing development. The, the Scottish Government and using SFT have created a situation, I think, whereby uh, they are dependent upon a few extremely large corporations who are essentially now just management contractors and even where this leads to poor quality development it seems to be that there's uh, little risk of, of recourse they tend not to be uh, challenged uh, for example um, you would not expect uh, the smallest local authority in the country Orkney Islands Council to be capable of taking on uh, Galliford Try a company with a turnover of 3.5 uh, billion uh, and it does strike me that the, the, the portal system for procurement uh, that we now have risks locking in monopolistic positions for the major players who then decide amongst themselves how they want to divide up different contract opportunities across the country. And this is frankly not in the interests of customers. 
It's not in the interest, I think, of the wider economy. It's smaller companies uh, find their ability to, to win contracts or secure reasonable margins where they are subcontracted sub suffer as a consequence and in turn reduces the opportunities to develop skills in local, uh, local economies, uh, particularly uh, in places like uh, the Highlands and Islands. Uh, the final point I wanted to make was in relation to an issue that I'll be very familiar uh, to the Minister from his various visits to Orkney over the years. It's in relation to uh, energy standards around uh, building regulations. Um, I, think there is, uh, I think there's ample evidence that the application of the building regulations isn't necessarily doing what we would expect or want it to, to do in, in, in the instance of, of Orkney. As the Minister uh, will know, I've made the case that at the moment they appear to be building in uh, fuel poverty a fabric first approach that um, could help address issues of fuel poverty, reduce bills across the board, as well as reduce uh, emissions. And I know that the Minister is sympathetic um, to this uh, argument. Uh, unfortunately, I think the way in which um, building standards uh, will, will apply the regulations um, is very much to the letter rather than necessarily to the spirit. And therefore, I think that does need uh, to be uh, address. But um, in conclusion, can I thank again uh, Bob Doris and his colleagues on the, the committee. I think they have shone a light uh, on, on an issue, on a, on, a, on a growing landscape where um, uh, there is clearly work to be done in terms of the improving the, the, the safeguards, uh, delivering the public policy objectives and, and delivering um, public expectations uh, about what should be uh, achieved through building regulations and, and fire safety. And I look forward to seeing uh, the outcome of their final report in due course. Thank you very much. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Jamie Halcrow Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I uh, am also not a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, but very much wanted to speak in today's debate with regard to casework that I have received, with regard to development that's taken place in my constituency, and with a, a, a mindfulness about the potential development that will take place in my constituency in years to come. And also correspondence from many architectural firms which are based in Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. This is an important and considered report and I, I strongly welcome it, which uh, is vitally uh, significant at a time when house building is so important for our national policy and the government's policy. And for example, there were nearly 9,000 affordable homes approved in 2016, a 20% rise. And we all welcome that. And as we move forward with that social housing development and also private sector development, it's really important that as we embark on that, we review where we are today and also how building standards have affected the last phase of development, particularly pre the financial crash. This report challenges us to ensure that these new builds going forward are of a high standard in terms of the regulatory framework which governs them, uh, their construction and the quality of build. And I have heard from a number of uh, constituents in Edinburgh and Northern Leith who have had problems now with their new build development, similar to those that have been articulated by other members. Problems with dampness, uh, insulation uh, issues, poor workmanship and an inability for recourse. In our determination to build more homes amid Scotland's current high housing demand, we must make sure that the standards of build are high and those that we would want for ourselves and each other and all of, our, all of the population of Scotland. The dominance of a, a few big firms, which has already been mentioned, um, working with a, a multitude of subcontractors can play a part in poor building standards in my experience. As the report explores, there, there should be, in my view, a more systematic and informed approach by uh, building standards those enforcing building standards to, ass to assess risk. For example, we need notifications to authorities of poorly performing building and construction firms with mandatory inspections during building alongside the risk-based approach that is currently adopted. As the report also helpfully notes, we will need careful scrutiny to determine the best way to manage this process and what penalties or sanctions should be in place to make sure that we prevent building works proceeding without the relevant building control warrant or relevant subsequent inspections. In Edinburgh, as in some other local authorities, attention is needed to ensure that local authorities continue to be the best bodies to act as verifiers for projects in their areas. And that is, again, something that's come uh, through to me from, from casework in my, in my constituency. 
Building control departments can fall short on occasion in terms of delays, uh, with, even with simple applications, and with regards to the care and attention they bring to projects. Constituents have noted concerns that too few warrant officers are visiting sites and that this is leading to delay. Uh, this can impact on quality of build as architects, builders and their clients are all stuck waiting for warrant approval. Having local authority control on verification can only offer a guarantee of standards if local authorities are also in a position to staff their relevant departments to, to meet the level that's needed. Um, that's why fees charged for building standards verification need to meet the cost of providing the service and I, that's why I also welcome the Minister's recent action to facilitate raising fees and recommendations in the report on this matter. As the report says, buying a house will for many people be the most significant purchase of their lifetime and it is understandably distressing for homeowners when the quality of build of their home is of a substandard. For constituents, this has been particularly pertinent with new builds. Therefore, I am also interested in the idea that's been put forward of a specific new ombudsman to shine light into this part of the housing sector. Uh, as part of this revision, people who have either bought or opted to rent a new off-plan uh, home uh, could be given the right to inspect their home prior to the buying or renting of, uh, process being finished and to defer completion until everything is satisfactory. Any good build process with the standards expected of those who build or build their houses uh, is hugely important. And, and the, the recession pushed out as much as half of the industry's skilled labor. Uh, a fifth of existing building workforce is set to retire in the next five years. So we all face a challenge when it comes to the construction skills gap and uh, we all need to work together in terms of supporting the education sector in that regard. Um, not least because of the consequences that Brexit will have on, on the building construction sector. There are a prolif there, there are, there's an issue in Scotland where uh, several of the builders do not have formal qualifications. And in this regard, I maybe want to add something to the debate where I think it is interesting and useful to make comparisons with Europe in order to consider how we could tackle this challenge and other challenges together. And in the time remaining, I'll just uh, give an indication of my understanding of what they do in some other European countries based on constituency correspondence as well as research. In Denmark, it is my understanding that there is a dedicated local government department in every local authority area whose role is to independently survey all newly constructed buildings for quality. This department has full legal power and authority to compel builders to rectify all faults before anybody can move into the development. In such cases, the builder is compelled to place a highly visible notice on the property, advertising that their work is not up to standard and that they have to carry out repairs. So, uh, you an have interesting to come to concept close, please. Um, I could go through another, uh, other examples, excuse me, Deputy President Officer, but I will write to the Minister in that regard. In closing, I would just like to say I warmly welcome the report and the collective, the collective aspiration within it. Um, and I see this as an opportunity, along with potentially the Planning Bill and perhaps the Warm Homes Bill as well, uh, to make progress on this very important issue uh, in all of our determination to serve our constituents and to enhance the urban environment of Scotland. Thank you. Uh, we now have to keep strictly to time, and I call Jamie Halcrow Johnson, followed by Richard Lyle. Deputy Presiding Officer, I'll certainly endeavour to. Um, I would like to welcome the detailed, a detailed and insightful report prepared by the Local Government and Communities Committee, uh, and I pay tribute to the work of the members and the clerking team. Um, it's clear that many deba debates uh, in this Parliament can inspire passion from all sides, and that's only to be expected in a Parliament as a normal part of parliamentary democracy. Um, but these debates today are set against the backdrop of two very serious incidents. The first, the tragic death suffered as a result of the fire at Grenfell Tower in June. The second, the collapse of the external wall at Oxgang's primary school, an incident that could have been far more serious in its consequences. Both exposed weaknesses in the construction work on the buildings and potentially weaknesses in how that construction was regulated. Much of the com committee's initial work in this inquiry, however, related to private housing construction rather than specific situations which have arisen. 
In all these cases, there are shared concerns in how safety is placed at the heart of regulation. The extraordinary circumstances of the two events mentioned have rightly received further scrutiny through the Cole Report and the independent public inquiry into Grenfell. The committee's report as a result has been wide ranging, looking at the question of building regulation and safety as a whole. But I'd like to focus on one key issue in relation to its finding and its evidence taken. As the committee's report acknowledges, a shortage of skilled, uh, skilled and well-trained entrants was cited by several contributors as being a significant factor in delays around obtaining building warrants and undermining compliance with building standards. The Federation of Master Builders echoed the point about a shortage in technical skills across the construction industry in the round and the impact this has had on building control departments in local authorities across Scotland. The Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors pointed to a lack of action on promoting building standards as a career choice. We know there are significant issues with providing the skilled workforce that will be required in the construction industry of the future. That is not only an economic issue, but also an issue that we may find constrains ambitious policies around building homes and infrastructure in the future. We have seen some positive work in promoting the construction industry, but more needs to be done, and particularly on building standards and related occupations. There is, of course, a wider backdrop around the availability of employment and progression. That is both a matter of providing for a healthy economy that is prepared to build, but also a significant issue for the public sector as an employer, which is why it was particularly concerning to see respondents like Highland Council stating candidly that local authority success and management in these areas had seemingly fallen off the radar. The committee noted the council's view that apprenticeships and apprentices and training surveyors seem to be a thing of the past. Overall, the CITB has identified a need for 12,000 new workers in the construction industry over and above currently committed modern apprenticeship places. Building safety training is, one of course vital across, is of course vital across the industry, but it is equally necessary that the need for specialists does not go unmet and that whatever solutions we find to enhance the protections that currently exist are adequately resourced and skilled. The Minister outlined some of these cases in response to questions by my colleague Alexander Stewart at the committee in its evidence session in September, and I welcome his commitments with the, to working with the industry. The Minister also spoke then of his concerns that a number of large firms were not taking on apprenticeships at the same level as the smaller firms, and that could, we that could well be a matter that needs addressed. All of these issues around skills and employment will, of course, be underlined by the regulation that accompanies them. The Cole Report made a number of proposals on areas for the Scottish Government to consider in relation to inspections for building work and the penalties where builders acted in improperly and proceed without the necessary certification and inspections taking place. One group of professionals that I've not yet touched upon is the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I do not intend to dwell too extensively on this, except to note their substantial role in visits and inspections. Uh, they do excellent work across Scotland, and particularly in my region of the Highlands and Islands, in ensuring fire safety and preventative approach. I would particularly draw attention to the committee's recommendations in this area and the concern raised by the Fire Brigades Union Scotland on handover of new build properties. Their evidence showed that there was a considerable problem of identity and formal changeover responsibility for these types of property between building control and the fire service. This is a concerning issue and one which I'm sure the ministerial working group and others will have looked into. Deputy Presiding Officer, in looking, forward, in looking forward to a future where safety is better regulated in construction projects, it is essentially we get the fundamentals right. This means a real focus on issues like skills, capacity and workforce planning. I welcome again the work that the committee has brought forward on this in its report, but it's clearly only a starting point for discussions that must take place. I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this committee report and the focus we've all had today on building and fire safety. It's a topic that continually needs to be addressed for the safety and peace of mind of Scottish citizens. Much has already been said regarding the tragedy of Grenfell. I only wish to add that my heart goes out to the friends and families of those who suffered loss of life, home and property. The resident of Grenfell Tower had numerous occasions expressed concern about the safety of the building prior to its destruction. This tragedy has made it abundantly clear that the concerns of tenants and homeowners are of the utmost importance. I believe that the UK Government inquiry will be far-reaching and it must address all comments and concerns of residents. This Scottish Government has made listening to the concerns of residents a top priority and in this way is working towards 
preventing any future disasters. I hope that through updating fire and building regulations, prevention will be the main cause of a safer Scotland. Angela Constance, Kevin Stewart, Annabel Ewing and the Ministerial Working Group have been working hard to assure Scottish citizens of their home in building safety. I think it is of, of benefit that Scottish Fire and Rescue has its service has extended its campaign to give fire safety advice to those living in high-rise buildings. Citizens can simply visit the Scottish Fire and Rescue website. Multi-storey flat safety information is on the front page. With the current fears surrounding multi-storey flats, a reassurance made by Scottish Fire and Rescue is that you are at no more risk of having a fire, a house fire in the multi-storey than those living in other types of houses. The website is full of useful information and I think it's important that all our constituents are aware of what to do in a fire situation. As the Ministerial Group in Building and Fire Safety brings new problems to the forefront, it is our job to make sure that the suggested regulations are quickly put into place. There are several three-storey buildings in my constituency that had a form of outside cladding and some residents had the misconception that this may be unsafe. It can be unsafe where it doesn't meet performance requirements. However, as we know from the report, cladding is made from different materials. I believe that much is being done to remove any hazard or potential dangerous cladding. So therefore, I have no concern regarding the external cladding which was used a number of uh, years ago to upgrade the buildings in my area. I note that this is addressed in the Scottish Building Standards and Fire Safety System that states the external wall should, ex should achieve a non-combustible reaction to fire classification or meet the performance levels when tested. If cladding passes the test, then residents should feel secure in, re in residing there. As evidenced in the report, however, any buildings that have, been used, that have used the same cladding that was on the Grenfell Tower are currently being removed or being removed with haste. In fact, the safety of buildings often goes be beyond cladding, and it's a combination of numerous factors such as insulation of fire doors, smoke detectors, heat detectors. I note the comments this afternoon we get regarding building standards, and we have to address those comments. It is the responsibility of those who are building to make sure that the structure has adhered to all regulations and, is, and they have not cut any corners. We also believe it's important that local authorities retain the control to prevent unsafe buildings from being built. Local authorities should make sure that no detail goes unnoticed by ensuring regular site observations of all new buildings or those being retrofitted. This also removes the possibility of a conflict of interest since a verifier from a local council would primarily be interested in the future safety of the residents. Most councils have done much to improve their performance and I still believe that the local council verifiers are still the most adept for the challenge at hand. Scottish Fire and Rescue do so much for the people of Scotland and deserve a special tribute to their efforts. We can only imagine the day-to-day -day life of firefighters. They sacrifice by working odd hours, training dil diligently and ultimately their own safety to save Scottish lives. We must ensure that Scottish Fire and Rescue is equipped and can be adapt to any and all situations they must face. I would now like to pay my compliments to building standards officers and the officers who work in these departments, their jobs are so essential to ensuring the safety of Scottish citizens. In my previous years as a councillor, I dealt with many building control issues on many occasions, helping constituents in regards to building control warrant issues. I'm grateful to those who do, I believe, dedicate their lives to make our country a safe one. Their job is a vital one. And they often work under a lot of stress to deliver high, excellent work in making sure buildings are up to par. But I note this afternoon the comments that regarding staffing levels, and I believe that councils must address these comments. It's important to remember that buildings are much more than just steel, stone, glass or mortar, but rather where families live, where, people, uh, where children learn, where parents work. I commend our government for proceeding in updating standards with care and concern for the citizens, all those who work towards making a safer Scotland. I'm sure over the next number of years we'll constantly review building procedures in order to uh, ensure that those procedures are kept up to date. In closing, uh, I would like to thank the committee and the convener for their excellent report and look forward to further debates on this issue. Thank you. 
I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Building regulations and standards, completion certificates, temporary safety certificates. All of these phrases have been the talk of the tune in Edinburgh in recent days as well as over the last 18 months. Even colleagues from other parts are likely to have heard about the new main stand at Tynecastle Stadium and the concern, particularly amongst Hearts fans, for it being completed on time. Success on completion ended days and weeks of speculation in the city over whether the stand would receive its temporary safety certificate as building works continued 24 hours a day in the lead up to the deadline. This was down to excellent and commendable cooperation between the club and Edinburgh City Council officials that it was met. But Tynecastle Stadium has also acted as a lifeline for school pupils in Edinburgh in recent times. It was used as, temporary, as a temporary school facility for Edinburgh pupils displaced as a result of the school's defect scandal that rocked the city last year. The coal report arising from that has been cited extensively in the committee report under discussion. Its findings are far-reaching, and Professor Cole himself highlighted that lessons should extend to procurement and construction in both the public and private sectors. A quote from that report captures the importance of the issues we are discussing today. It said, in relation to the original incident at Oxgang School in January 2016, the fact that no injuries or fatalities to children resulted from the collapse of the gable wall at Oxgang School was a matter of timing and luck. Approximately nine tons of masonry fell on an area where children could easily have been standing or passing through. One does not require much imagination to think of what the consequences might have been if it had happened an hour or so later. That stark statement declares the critical importance of building standards. The message that cutting corners and bypassing responsibility can lead to loss of life. And that is why this local government committee report is so important and so welcome. So what have we learned from such a major incident, not just for building schools? Um, Cole found that the funding model of PPP was not to blame for what happened, although it may have affected the mindset of local authorities when it came to responsibilities for projects. Whatever funding model is used, however, there is no excuse for lack of essential scrutiny. There must be a rigorous system of checks and balances that doesn't simply pass the buck and assume that the contractor is delivering what they've promised. That formed a central part of Cole's findings that the City of Edinburgh Council should not have delegated away responsibility and instead independent scrutiny should have been in place. Cole's recommendation that public bodies act as intelligent customers within procurement processes has been highlighted in the local government report. And surely it should be a given that the schools our young people spend so much time in are safe for them. How is this to be achieved? Well, amongst the, the many recommendations, I was particularly taken with the idea of a clerk of works present at building sites and which appears to be one potential step towards gaining that confidence and becoming an intelligent customer. In the Edinburgh Schools case, it could have made all the difference. Problems identified, such as lack of wall and header ties and other brickwork accessories, were parts of the construction that could have been observed during building before they were covered up by external walls. But in the case of the Edinburgh Schools scandal, these vital elements were missed. Not only could a traditional clerk of works potentially have identified these problems at the time, but as is suggested in the report, the mere presence of such a person can positively influence the quality of work being done by contractors. Worryingly though, as Cole states, the inspection role traditionally undertaken by a combination of resident architects, engineers and clerks of works has not only dramatically reduced over recent years, but, and I quote, the essential role they played does not appear to have been effectively provided for by alternative arrangements within the forms of procurement currently in vogue. As seen in Edinburgh, 
that is false economics, and I think the minister himself recognized that in his committee evidence. There are, of course, as I've said, many other recommendations in the report worthy of consideration. But if the government takes these on board, it will, of course, need to assist in addressing skills shortages in relevant parts of the construction industry, including availability of clerks of works properly qualified in partnership with industry itself. The safety of our buildings and those who use them demands this. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, and following on perhaps from Ben McPherson's comments about some of the um, available options in the Danish system, perhaps we even need to consider bringing back the Dean of Guildcourt. The last contribution before the closing speeches is John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I think it can be a challenge for those of us who have not been on a particular committee uh, to then take part in the subsequent committee debate uh, as we're doing today. Clearly, committee members have been steeped in this subject for weeks, if not months, uh, so I and others cannot possibly have that level of in-depth experience of actually preparing the report. However, I suppose what I and others uh, like myself uh, can do today is to have a fresh pair of eyes to look at this topic, and my comments today are from that perspective. Clearly, Grenfell and the Edinburgh schools have been a major cause of public concern and are reflected in the report. Our thoughts continue to be with those affected and colleagues have specifically spoken about them. However, I thought I would focus my remarks uh, more on new private homes, as that is probably the sector I've had most local casework on over my years as a councillor, an MP, and now an MSP. My constituency of Glasgow Shettleston includes an extensive boundary with both North and South Lanarkshire, where once uh, there was Greenbelt, and that area has been very popular with builders and households for new housing over the last 20 years. So paragraph 68 to 83 on the verification certification process and paragraphs 114 to 141 on accountability and the responsibility of builders were of particular interest and are what I will focus on. I thought paragraph 71 on the risk criteria for an inspection plan was interesting. And I was particularly interested in point six within that contractor competence and paragraph 73, which considers uh, if there had been problems with a builder previously. Now, it certainly has been my experience over nearly 20 years that for some building companies, I have seldom, if ever, had complaints about them from constituents, while for others, I have had regular, and in some cases, numerous complaints. As paragraph 139 says, a home is the biggest purchase most people will make, and I think almost every speaker has quoted that as well. And yet, sometimes it seems they get more help if they bought a faulty children's toy or had a dodgy meal in a restaurant. One example recently, uh, and I have to say, uh, I'm going to refer to the builder, but this is only the most recent one because there certainly have been other builders in a similar situation. But one example recently has been Persimmon's new development at what is called Lowlands in Bailiston. I have visited a number of the homes there where you could uh, just press the internal walls and they moved, uh, and a room was completely freezing because the insulation had just been missed out. If a builder is still in sight, I know residents who have just painted a large X or similar on their front door eh, as a way of warning other prospective buyers about potential problems in that housing estate. And I have to say that has proven to be quite an effective way of getting a builder around your house quite quickly eh, to sort out the problems. Obviously, that only works if the builder's still there. Can I say at this point, too, that while the actual building itself tends to be the main focus of attention, if I've bought a house for 150 or 200,000 pounds and the back garden is subsiding away gradually or the grass will not grow because the drainage is substandard, these are maybe external issues, but they are also extremely serious and potentially very expensive for the homeowner to sort. So it does seem to me pretty clear that some builders are riskier than others. Being an accountant, I wonder if there might be lessons to be learned from the audit process which most large organisations have to go through. The amount of work and detailed checking that the external auditors will do depends hugely on assessing the risk, including looking at internal controls and internal audit. If these internal controls are strong, the external auditor can rely more on them and can reduce the detailed checking that they do, although it will never entirely eliminate that. Reading the report, I just wonder if council building control departments 
are really assessing risk site by site and builder by builder as thoroughly as they could be. On accountability in paragraphs 114 to 141, a few things did c concern me. Paragraph 121 quotes Edinburgh Council evidence, which included, quote, the house building industry needs to be educated to take more responsibility for its actions, unquote. And, quote, greater accountability and traceability should be introduced to encourage individuals to take personal responsibility, unquote. Now, I have to say, seeing such words like that as educate and encourage strike me as indicative of a less than robust system, and that concerns me. I cannot imagine a finance department being encouraged or educated to take responsibility for the organization's finances. They are responsible. The point is also made in paragraph 123 in relation to England, and others have mentioned this, about the possibility of an ombudsman, or should it be an ombudsperson to mediate between the consumer and the builder or the warranty provider. I've wondered too sometimes if trading standards could be involved. When I've tried that approach in Glasgow, they seem to rely entirely on NHBC and, and, and similar. But as I said, as uh, has been said elsewhere, NHBC have a slightly different role and I do not think they are seen as independent in the same way. On the question of who should verify building standards, I have met NHBC and felt they did put forward quite a strong case. Delays in the present system and faults that have been missed suggest that something needs to change. And I was interested in their point that the committee asked no questions in this section, whereas it did on others. The fees system for building warrants in paragraphs 43 to 67. Questions are asked if the fees should be ring-fenced or linked to improvements. And having been a councillor for 10 years, I have some sympathy for local authorities and a bit of concern about ring fencing. If there is a requirement to keep fees within that service, they certainly should be allowed to keep full costs like rent and council overheads. A final point would be one raised uh, with me by a few constituents. If the government is putting money into new homes, for example, the help to buy scheme, some people do assume that the government is giving some kind of stamp of approval as to the quality of these homes and constituents have found it particularly galling that government encouraged them and helped them to buy a home and the home turned out to be substandard. Anyway, I congratulate the committee on the work they've been doing and certainly encourage them to continue work in this sector, which is a hugely important one for me and my constituents. Thank you. Um, that was the conclusion of the last open debate speech and I would have expected everyone who took part in the debate to be back in the chamber by now. However, we move on to the closing speeches and I call on Daniel Johnson. Um, six minutes, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, I think I can safely say this has been an interesting and engaging and in-depth debate. It, it, it raises some actually very fundamental and some big questions ranging from you know, the, the, what one can expect from is buying a new home, which is, being, which is a new build home, through to the safety of our schools and public places. It's also reflected on the tragic uh, events that surrounding the Grenfell Tower and what we need to learn and do to ensure that our buildings are safe going forward in the future. But it also touches on the Edinburgh schools crisis um, that, that many members have mentioned. And I I think it's incumbent on me to reflect on that for a moment, given that it affected my constituency very directly. The Oxgangs Primary School, which was the, the school whose uh, wall fell down in January 2016, its uh, uh, catchment area is largely within my constituency. It affected St Peter's Primary School, which is in my constituency. And as Gordon Lindhurst uh, pointed out, it was only through sheer chance and luck that that nine tonnes of masonry that fell to the ground didn't do anyone any harm, let alone take any lives. And I think it's with that in mind that we need to think about this debate and the requirements that we have for building standards. Because as Professor Cole pointed out, and I will touch on this in more depth, every step of the building process requires an improvement in terms of its level of scrutiny and check. And I think it does raise the two fundamental questions that we should be asking in this debate. It's how can we change how our buildings are built in the future, ensuring that they are checked and verified pro uh, uh, properly, but also, and, and just as importantly, what steps do we need to take to verify that the buildings which have already been built are safe? So I welcome this debate. I actually especially just like to comment on the approach that this committee has taken. I think it is a novel approach asking Parliament 
uh, questions and seeking to incorporate that debate within a final report. And I think that's something to commend. And I think it has actually added something to this debate in terms of asking the blunt questions about what should we expect? Why shouldn't we think of uh, buying a house in the same way as we buy other consumer products? And what do we do, need to do to make our buildings safe? But I would like to touch on the call report. And in some ways, I think what Andy Whiteman, and it's a shame he's not in the chamber right now, touched on, actually went to the right of the heart of call. Now, he didn't mention call directly, but Andy's, uh, Andy Whiteman's questioning of who is doing what and for whom, on whose behalf, I think is the fundamental question that Cole asked. Because he went right the way through the, the procurement and build stage, procurement, design, build, handover, and maintenance, asking every stage really what had been going on. And the, the fundamental problem was, was that local authorities had been treating those building contracts as black boxes with a, a reluctance to inspect, which in the words of the report, because they were worried about incurring liability themselves. And that is fundamentally what has to change. We need verification in steps. We need the actual, the, 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 the structural components as they put on to, to be, be certified and checked. Now that is a, about a number of things. A number of people have identified Clark of Works and that is absolutely right and a fundamental uh, insight from the call report. But as Jamie Halco Johnson was also pointing out, there's also about individual contractors and tradespeople being properly trained and taking responsibility for their work. So we need those skills, but we also need those skilled people to take responsibility for the work. And that's another fundamental point from the call report. Another point that has been come to the fore, and I'm glad it has, is around building control and what we should expect. And I thought Sandra White did an excellent job of really trying to get to grips with, well, what does this jargon mean? What should we expect? Surely if it has a building certificate, that building should be safe. And it strikes me as <laughs> remarkable that we have to ask that question. I think, you, uh, I think Sandra White used the experience that we need to open up the buildings to check what has actually been done. And that's exactly what we have uh, we have to ensure happens. But it's not what is happening, because beneath the guise of the risk-based approach, we have a huge variation of what is actually being checked, what is being verified, and we need greater standardization. And the tragedy is, is the reality of why that's not happening is because of resource. When we asked those questions at the Education Committee, what came back was, well, building control can't guarantee those things. They are unable to because they don't have the resource and able to do it. We'd need a huge increase in resource if we were wanting building control to do it. And even when I put those questions to the minister, the minister uh, uh, acknowledged that there needed to be much greater investment if that was what we wanted to see. Now, I think we all know what greater investment uh, is a euphemism for in this context. But this, as Mark Griffin pointed out, is a, is a vital local service and one that we need to do, get, it does underwrite safety. And I'll, I'll let the Minister intervene on that. Kevin Stewart. I think I made it quite clear about investment and that's one of the reasons why I took the decision to allow for an increase in charges from uh, since 2005, the first one. Now, I think that uh, I've made it quite plain, I think the committee has made it quite plain, as have others in this debate that local authorities need to look at that increased resources and ensure that they build up their building standards sections. If they choose not to do that, then that's something I'll have to look at at a later time. Daniel Johnson. I'd merely point out that it was a, quite a long period of time between 2005 and 2017 before we saw those increase in fees, and, and I think we need to question what's been happening in the meantime. Now, a number of uh, members uh, talked about the Ministerial Working Group. And indeed, I think uh, Bob Doris was absolutely right to ask and urge the government to make sure that this is not something that is essentially a one-off process, but it's something that's ongoing and continues to look at the scope to, to take, undertake that fundamental work to make sure that we, we have the right safety standards and procedures in place. And I think, likewise, Dave Stewart quite rightly think questioned the scope of that work. I think there has very rightly been an emphasis on high-rise residential buildings, an emphasis on cladding, because that is what has triggered this. But we have to keep questioning, keep probing, because we don't know what other issues are out there. Because critically, one of the other key findings of the core report was the failure to install fire-stopping measures in our buildings. Professor Cole, also in evidence to our committee, he said we don't know how big that problem is. And I think for as long as we have these, as Donald Rumsfeld might have put it, unknown unknowns. We need to keep pushing and challenging our building regulations and our fire regulations. And we need to make sure we have an inspection regime that is properly resourced to make sure that all our public buildings are safe. Thank you.
disappointing to note that we still don't have a full complement of those who took part in this debate. And I call Alexander Stewart. Around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to close on behalf of the Conservatives and as a member of a Local Government and Communities Committee myself. Uh, we've heard today how we had the opportunity to deal with this inquiry, uh, and the Committee wanted to ensure that uh, we took on board events that have taken place. And as we've heard earlier today, uh, the report on the independent inquiry into the uh, construction of the Edinburgh schools uh, gave us a, a, a lot of food for thought. But the main objective that expanded our uh, uh, inquiry was the, uh, the tragic uh, fence at Grenfell Tower and many members today have gone through uh, that whole issue uh, of, of the safety of the building uh, and the situation we found ourselves in. Local authorities are responsible for the enforcement of building regulations and the Act on 200, 2003 gives them that power to deal with work uh, out with building warrants. Now the committee wanted to expand uh, at the parameters and see what was happening with regard to verification across Scotland uh, and the building standards system in Scotland uh, was changed in 2005 to permit uh, the appointment of verifiers uh, and the balance of that is much uh, very much a scorecard approach uh, and we wanted to see how that progressed. Uh, the committee took lots of evidence and information and I pay tribute to uh, those who came and told us uh, uh, their situations from the organisations, from the individuals uh, and uh, in, uh, in anyone who wanted to give us the nightmare scenario they may have faced or the situation they were finding themselves in. And I think that was the crux of the matter, Deputy Presiding Officer. We took individuals' uh, words and they told us in facts uh, about how things were and how things should be and, and the stories that they had gone through. So over 90% of respondents to the survey that we sent out online uh, talked about uh, the, uh, the undertaking of, uh, and half of them believed that there should be an expanded beyond local authorities dealing with verification, whereas 40% thought that the verification should remain within local authorities. Notwithstanding, in March uh, of this year, the minister appointed the 32 local authorities as the verifiers of their own geographical area. Uh, and some believe uh, that the verification should be extended and expanded uh, and, and as I say, the evidence gave us that. The Minister appointed different local authorities as verifiers for different periods of time, depending on their performance. Uh, if some local authorities continue to underperform, then they should have the possibility of verification being moved. And I welcome the comments that the Minister has said today uh, about authorities not doing the job and being challenged, because I think that's vitally important that we give the confidence within the industry and the confidence within the sector uh, that that is the case, and that the roles and the responsibilities and the rights of the people are protected. Uh, and, I, and I thank him for the comments he made. We've had many uh, good contributions, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I pay tribute to my own other member, the Conservative member on the, on the committee, Graham Simpson, who was the one who uh, should be congratulated and commended because he was the one who endeavoured to ensure that all of us took this on board. He, like myself, had been a, a local councillor, so we knew uh, of the difficulties that were happening in our own constituent and own wards that we dealt with in the past. But he had the, uh, the, the tenacity to uh, make sure that it did become a reality, and I commend him for that. Uh, and as I say, at the evidence sessions, uh, the, the, it, the evidence spoke volumes about the problems that individuals were, were, were facing. Uh, now, Bob Doris, our, our committee convener, uh, set the context today uh, of the, uh, the, the whole report and the way we've been tackling it as, as a committee and talked about the evidence and accountability mm -hmm. uh, and also talked about us being able to monitor the Minister's working group as it progresses. And I think that's also vitally important, that we have that contact uh, between us. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne gave a very passionate and knowledgeable and understandable uh, speech about the fire situation in Sports. And, and I pay tribute to Sandra White, who also talked about her own constituency uh, and the problems that she faces uh, in that location and, and the anxieties that individuals who live and are in that location have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, those of us who don't have that kind of uh, constituency to manage, uh, it, it must be a real challenge for, for you as an MSP and them to make sure that you've got the information uh, that they require. David Stewart, I think, was very passionate about his idea about the Scottish uh, solution uh, and wants to deal with the fire sprinkler system. Uh, and I commend him for what you're trying to achieve. And I look forward to seeing your members' bill uh, progressing uh, and the discussion that we can all have at that time. Uh, Jimmy Halco Johnson talked about the weaknesses that are taking place within the industry uh, and that the safety issues should be at the heart. And that's what we all want, dear President, that the safety issues should be at the heart of this whole process and the shortages that, that are within the building industry and the action that's required. 
Andy Whiteman, uh, unfortunately, is not here, but he talked about the robust uh, situation that we have. But there are weaknesses within that. Uh, he's just arrived. <laughs> uh, uh, and, I, and, and I do, you know, he talked about the, the crisis that we have uh, within the housing sector uh, from the speculative nature. And that has to be managed and, 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 and realise that that is a major problem as we go forward. Liam MacArthur uh, thanked the committee for what they're doing and talked about accountability uh, and capacity issues. Now, we all understand there are capacity issues. For anyone who has been in local government uh, for the 18 years that I was uh, and others in the chamber have been similar, there are certainly capacity issues within local government and they need to be addressed. And I'm sure that we will continue to challenge uh, ministers and the government uh, as we go forward on that. Ben McPherson, uh, I, I, you talked about the, the affordability situation and the, uh, and the uh, affordable homes and the review of building standards and some of the difficulties that you face within your constituency, which is a very different constituency standard of whites. You may have a more affluent area where people have different aspects as what you're trying to achieve uh, in some respects uh, 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 as to what we have. But there's a balance to be judged there when you're dealing with affordability and the aspects uh, of individuals uh, and what they seem to, ha to have. But it was Gordon Linhurst that really hit the nerve, uh, 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 presiding officer, when he talked about uh, the, the whole idea of going forward uh, and, and the cost of life uh, and all of that. So to conclude, uh, I thank everybody for their contributions today. Uh, the, as I've said before, it's the confidence we need in the system to ensure that we have the safeguards in place to protect the people and our constituents. And I pay tribute to the, the staff, the supporters and the clerks who helped us through this process. Thank you. Ken. Call on Kevin Stewart. Uh, up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And I'd like to thank all members uh, for their views today. And I can assure them that I'll give careful consideration as we progress our work. Um, I apologise in advance because I'm not going to be able to mention every single thing uh, that has come up today or to acknowledge every single member's contribution. Uh, but I, I would like to thank very much the Local Government and Communities Committee uh, for this wide-ranging and considered investigation into building standards in Scotland. I'd also like to thank the Education and Skills Committee uh, for their previous inquiry uh, too. Uh, and again, uh, much of this work will inform and feed into the various reviews uh, that my officials are taking forward. Uh, we all want the houses we live in and the buildings that we use every day to be as safe as possible. Uh, and good building standards underpin the safety of us all. We spend nearly 90% of our time uh, in buildings, and it's vital that in looking to the future, we make every effort possible to continually improve our standards. The safety of people in and around buildings is of paramount importance to ministers, and is at the core of the Scottish building standard system. Um, and I uh, recognise uh, the contributions that were made by Mr. Johnson uh, and Mr. Lindhurst pointing out the Ox Gang situation. Uh, that was a matter of timing and luck. And that should not happen, full stop. That should not happen. Uh, and we need to ensure uh, that we get the, these things absolutely right. And for our buildings to be safe, Everyone, everyone involved needs to play their part. They must understand their own roles and responsibilities and understand the roles and responsibilities of others in that construction chain. That applies all the way through from procurement, initial and detailed design through construction, and most importantly, at final sign off. And we must ensure uh, that all of that comes into play and is done absolutely properly. Local authorities also have their um, uh, role to play uh, as verifiers uh, and, and of course um, uh, we've had some debate today around about verification itself. Now I took some different steps from my predecessors in terms of appointing verifiers last, uh, last time uh, earlier on this year um, and I will continue uh, to monitor what is going on across the country. I, would, I will say to members now, presiding officer, that last week, Edinburgh faced an audit from my officials. Glasgow will face an audit next week. And that work will continue to ensure that there is a drive uh, to improvement in these areas. 
Presiding officer, I want to turn to some of the points that members have made, because uh, I think that's the most important part of this debate. And if I don't get to you, I have comprehensive notes here, and I will ensure that your comments are fed in uh, to the processes that we are undertaking. First of all, if I could turn to Mr. Stewart, who long has had an interest in building standards um, and uh, has had an interest uh, in fire safety too. Um, and I recognise that he has had conversations um, with the Cabinet Secretary um, and has taken part in a number of fora here in the Parliament, including ones that I've attended. Uh, and I appreciate his input. Um, in terms of his, his call about uh, fitting sprinklers into uh, new and existing social housing, we've gone further than many other places in the UK in terms of, of sprinklers. Um, and the review of building standards uh, under the Ministerial Working Group will take account of all relevant evidence, including what is going on in, already in Angus, Fife and, uh, and Dundee. And I think that anything that makes people, the people of Scotland, safer uh, in their own homes has to be looked at very carefully indeed. Uh, we will look at that closely uh, and we will take any actions forward based on that evidence. Uh, in terms of comments by uh, Mr Johnson um, about aspects of the uh, ministerial working group being focused um, too much on high-rise. Uh, what we said, right, well, first of all, we said it would be a short-term ministerial working group. That short term has, uh, has disappeared. We have said that we will work through all of this methodically. Obviously, um, the situation at Grenfell um, has taken our attention. And I think the first thing that we needed to do uh, was to ensure the safety of uh, folk living in high-rise properties in Scotland. Um, we will continue to work along that way until we are absolutely certain um, that we have captured all of the information that we need and taken the appropriate action. We will then move on to other aspects uh, of building standards and fire safety. Uh, so we will not be ignoring other aspects. We will look at all of this. And in particular, uh, Mr. Uh, Stewart uh, talked of folk in deprived areas who are more at risk at fire. And I think that we need to take that evidence-based approach to see exactly what is required to keep people safe. And I can assure him that we will look at that in some depth. Another major issue which has been raised is round about um, Clark of Works. Uh, and I expect improving the role of Clark of Works and other professionals to provide the reassurance of building owners carrying out work uh, to be considered again uh, within the work remit of the Building Standards Compliance and Enforcement Group chaired by John Cole. Uh, I had the great pleasure this morning of meeting a Clark of Works at a, a link housing development here in Edinburgh. And I'm always impressed by the detailed knowledge of Clark of Works, and I'm always impressed by um, uh, what people have to say about their new homes or their new buildings if there's been a Clark of Works there. Um, because snagging does not seem to be quite such an issue um, in these regards. Uh, the other thing which I did this morning is what I always do when I visit these sites is to, visit, uh, to speak to apprentices. They are the future. We must all encourage more people to enter into the construction industry. It has a, a great future, and I think we all, across the parties, have a part to play in ensuring uh, that folk enter into that industry. Uh, Presiding officer, I realise that I'm going, uh, 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 running out of time fast. What I would say uh, to close is that the Ministerial Working Group uh, can reassure uh, Parliament that the government is committed to ensuring that lessons are learned and action is taken to make building safe. We are ready to respond to any new evidence that emerges, uh, whether that be from the UK and further afield, from our own working group, from the two review groups on fire uh, and compliance and enforcement, uh, and we will consider the findings from the committee's report and the debate today and identify the actions that need to be taken. Finally, presiding officer, what I would say uh, to every member is that we will be as open and transparent on this issue. Um, and we appreciate those folks who have fed in uh, to what we have been doing thus, uh, thus far. And I would appreciate it if all members continue to do so. Thank you very much, President Officer.
I now call on Bob Doris to close the debate on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee. If you take us to decision time, please, Mr Doris. That is 4.40, not 5 o'clock. Uh, I'm delighted it's not 5 o'clock. <laughs> I think everyone else is as well, presiding officer. Can I start off by thanking, actually, the, the Clarkin team on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee, SPICE, who have helped inform us, all those who gave evidence and written in oral format, and also fellow MSPs, but actually to the building control officers the length and breadth of Scotland who do a difficult job in challenging circumstances. This inquiry is no slight on them. So I want to thank everyone today for their thoughtful contributions and views. I am sure that they will assist the committee when we return to these issues next year. It would be useful, it would be usual that the deputy convener would be summing up at this point. However, Elaine Smith unfortunately is unable to be with us this afternoon, so you're stuck with me for a, for a second uh, speech the, this afternoon. I, I, I want to begin by raising an issue that I know Elaine would have most certainly raised had she been here, and that is the need for a Clark of Works. Clark of Works were once a regular feature of public construction, acting on behalf of the client to ensure that buildings were constructed to high quality and helping to ensure any defects are rectified at a time they arise. However, we learned that their use has declined over recent years, albeit some suggested that a few companies may be beginning to, to use them more often than they have done recently. The presence of Clark of Works was recognised in the Cole report as impacting positively on the approach of site operatives to the quality of their work. The Minister also commented that Clark of Works might involve some spending on the ground, but it will save a lot more in the future. Whilst we recognise that the Cole report was in response to a particular set of circumstances in Edinburgh schools, we are keen to see that lessons learned there are considered in a wider context. We have therefore recommended that consideration should be given to using Clark of Works in a wider range of public sector construction projects, such as high value or very, very innovative construction projects. The positive impact of Clark of Works can have on build quality and addressing defects as they arise was the key reason for persuading us that they should be used more widely. I also know that the Education and Skills Committee, in its report on school infrastructure, which followed the Cole report, said that unless there are clear reasons why another method of quality assurance would be more suitable, the employment of a clerk of works reporting to the client should be part of, a very, of every capital project in the public sector. And I'm delighted that the Minister signalled in correspondence to the Education Committee that guidance may be updated to suggest that should indeed be the case. And in relation to the contributions we've had this afternoon, I'm going to start with the Minister who said that there should be a risk-based assessment in terms of building warrants and the verification process. Our committee believes there should be a mandatory aspect to that, which there isn't currently. Uh, we certainly believe that the clerk of works and the use of them would uh, lend itself to there being less risk in a project, so therefore perhaps requiring less attention in terms of ongoing checks throughout the construction process. Perhaps we should look at the experience of the builder or the architect or the track record of the developer when deciding how often we should be going out and inspecting these works on the ground. But I think, yes, of course. I appreciate uh, Mr Doris giving way because I, I think one of the things which I missed out in my summing up, which I meant to address, was actually uh, a comment which was made by uh, Liam MacArthur and some others around about making sure that penalties uh, are enforced. I think that that's something that we need to look at very, very carefully uh, indeed. Uh, and I can assure the convener that I will do, do that as we progress. Uh, thank you, Mr Stewart. Bob Doris. I thank the Minister for, for that information. I think generally across the board in the Chamber we've identified that a clerk of work will drive up standards in the construction sector. And I have to know Andy Whiteman's contribution in relation to the conflict in relation to who the clerk of works would be accountable towards. And that's something that has to be ironed out. And I appreciate that within the private sector. The minister mentioned that we have to have the right skills to attract and retain uh, the right people within the sector and the forthcoming industry summit. Jamie Halcrow Johnson, Dave Stewart, and Mark Griffin also made similar points to making sure the skills were there and those skills were funded within local authority building control departments. Now, I know that a recent fee increase will give an additional 3.5 million to local authorities, but I do note that money 
will not be ring fenced. And I do know there's some debate about whether that will allow full cost recovery in relation to all the expenses that building co control departments have to spend, and that has to be part of the debate. I was fascinated by some of the contribution by uh, Graham Simpson, particularly in relation to his constituency experience in relation to foundation issues uh, that, that uh, occurred in relation to uh, some of his constituents and in roofing issues within the construction process. And the key thing that I recognised is the developers dealt with the issue, but legally they didn't have to deal with the issue. It was one of goodwill. It should be one of goodwill. It should be one of compulsion and enforcement. Uh, and I think John Mason extended out to talk about not just the bricks and mortar in relation to this, but also the gardening and landscaping of the property roundabout. I just want to put on record uh, my respect for the work David Stewart has done in relation to fire suppression systems. Uh, the committee remains open-minded to the use of that and we've listened carefully to uh, the information David Stewart brought to the chamber and also to Sandra White who I actually thought uh, her suggestion that it's £2,000 a day in relation to fire safety at Glasgow Harbour sounds like a private company profiteering from uh, fire safety and that's not acceptable. By and large, I also note that most of us, just about everyone, I think, wanted local authority verifiers to be retained. But I do note that that did mean we don't want to see improved standards within local authorities. And the time is almost upon us, presiding officer. So I just want to say that, uh, finishing off, that our committee will return to this inquiry in the new year. We look forward to the updates from the Minister in relation to this. But it would be wrong of me not to finish in relation to a point about Grenfell, presiding officer, as we started off here today. One of the issues in relation to Grenfell was that tenants and residents were not listened to, that they were not empowered, and that their fears and concerns were not acted upon. I actually thought Richard Lyle put it very well when he said that buildings and homes are not just steel, stone, glass or mortar but their homes for families. And what our housing association movement has done very well in response to Grenfell is develop that social community contract with all the residents who live in high rises to make sure that they have been reassured and that there is good quality fire safety. But we can never be complacent. Our committee will return to this matter in the new year and we look forward to updating Parliament, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 9170 on committee membership. And I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick uh, to move the motion on behalf of the Bureau. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, now minded to, I'm now minded to accept a motion without notice to bring forward decision time to now. Uh, can I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move such a motion? Moved. Very much. Uh, are we all agreed that decision time be brought forward to now? Yes. We are agreed. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 8968 in the name of Bob Doris on behalf of the Local Government and Communities Committee on Building Regulations and Fire Safety in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 9170 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed, and that concludes decision time. I now close this meeting.